So, in the mind of Jewish people, how did they know if someone was the Messiah or not? <laughs> and why did G Jesus ride into Jerusalem and then wreck the temple? We are going to talk about that in this chapter, Mark 11. Let's read. When they came near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go your way into the village that is opposite you. Immediately as you enter into it, you will find a young donkey tied on which no one has sat. Untie him and bring him. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs him, and immediately he will send him back here. They went away and found a young donkey tied at the door outside in the open street, and they untied him. Some of those who stood there asked them, what are you doing untying the young donkey? They said to them, just as Jesus had said, and they let them go. They brought the young donkey to Jesus and threw their garments on it, and Jesus sat on it. Many, many spread their garments on the way, and others were cutting down branches from trees and spreading them on the road. Those who went in front and those who followed cried out, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is coming in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. <laughs> Jesus entered into the temple in Jerusalem. When he had looked around at everything, it being now evening, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day, when he had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree far off having leaves, he came to see if perhaps he might find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Jesus told it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard it. They came to Jerusalem, and Jesus entered into the temple and began to throw out those who sold and those who bought in the temple, and overthrew the money changers, tables, and the seats of those who sold the doves. He would not allow anyone to carry a container through the temple. He taught, saying to them, Isn't it written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the scribes heard it, and they sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the multitudes were astonished at his teaching. When evening came, he went out of the city. As they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered away from the roots. Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Most certainly I tell you, whoever may tell this mountain be taken up and cast into the sea, and doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is happening, he shall have whatever he says. Therefore I tell you, all things, whatever you pray and ask for, believe that you have received them, and you shall have them. Whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your transgressions. They came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him, and they began, saying to him, By what authority do you do these things? Or who gave you the authority to do these things? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. They reasoned with themselves, saying, If we should say from heaven... <laughs> He will say, why then did you not believe him? If we should say for men, they feared the people, for they all held that John was really a prophet. They answered Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus said to them, neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. All right. Um, this is the chapter of the Palm Sunday, like the ride into Jerusalem where Jesus is welcomed in as the Messiah. So now it's not just the 12 disciples that know, everyone knows. <laughs> and they're, they're waving Psalm, is it Psalm 118? What Psalm is it that has that? Uh, it is Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. And so Hosanna means save us. So here's the crowds, they're, they're cheering you know, blessed is he who comes in God's name. You're the Messiah. Save us, O King. 
their thinking save us from this terrible political situation we've got with the Romans, you know, you're going to be the fulfilment of all those prophecies in Isaiah and they're thinking physical, but Jesus is coming to save them. But he's coming to save them from the greater oppressors of sin and death. <laughs> uh, he's coming to save them from the works of the evil one. So Jesus was coming to save them and he was a coming king. They just got it all confused. Um. He comes into town and he looks at the temple that night and he goes home. Um, the next day, he's coming back to the temple, but this time he's coming with a whip. Now, sometimes you read the story of the cleansing of the temple and you think to yourself, um, wow, Jesus is going crazy. Um, he's whipping and knocking over tables. This is a planned act. This isn't just a case of him turning up and, and just being angry in the moment. N Jesus came and saw the temple. That's what it says right here in, in um, this is verse 11, chapter 11, verse 11. It says, he entered into the temple, he looked at everything, and then being evening, he went back to Bethany. Now, Bethany, that's the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. That's where they lived. He probably was staying with them. He often did. And so he, they're all staying in Bethany, which is just half a mile away down the road. But he goes and looks at the temple. And he just, it's almost like he says, I'm coming back tomorrow and I'm wrecking this place. <laughs> he comes with a whip. You don't just have a whip on hand. I mean, do you have a whip on hand? No one just has a whip laying around on hand. You've got to organize that. So Jesus organizes to have a whip, whether he asks someone to get it for him, he comes back with a whip and he makes a mess of the place. On the way back in the morning, they see a fig tree and he curses it. And that fig tree is a symbol of Israel and it had no fruit on it. And Israel as a nation was not fruitful to God and he was upset. He comes into the temple and he makes a mess of the place. It says here that he th started to throw out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. He overthrew the money changers' tables and the seats of those who sold the doves. He would not allow anyone to carry a container through the temple. And he said, isn't, this, isn't my house supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? Um, I, th I think there's multiple problems going on here. When I talked about this in Matthew's Gospel, I was explaining about the, the, the selling in the temple that, where they were ripping people off. So some churches have little bookshops, but those little bookshops are like a service to the Christians. You know, they sell Bibles, and it's not a money-making operation. They're often run at a loss. They're doing it as a service. But what was going on in the temple was a, a money-making racket. <laughs> So Jesus is upset about that because you've got people that will come from all over the ancient world to these, like they're pilgrims. You've got normally 100,000 people in Jerusalem, but at Passover time and, and at the time of other feasts, the population of the city would swell. Josephus wrote at, in one Passover there was a million people there. So that's like a, a lot of people have come and they've come to sacrifice. They're not, they can't bring their sheep and their goats and everything with them. They buy them when they get there. And so there's a racket going on. The prices of these things have gone up, but not only the prices of sacrifices have gone up, but there is money changing going on. The Romans had a currency, the denarius and the shekel. The, sorry, the denarius and the, what's the other one called? Um, anyway, they have currency, but the, this currency has the face of Caesar on it. But Caesar was, you know, in the minds of many Roman people, like a god. They could not allow that Roman money in the temple because they couldn't have any graven images in the temple, so they have to change the money. So people are coming from all over the Roman world and from some other places, and they're bringing their money, but they have to change their money into temple money or temple currency so that they can use the temple currency to buy their sacrifice. So there's two steps. You, you're coming, you've, you're a pilgrimage, you can't bring your sacrifice, you have to change your money to temple money, and at that point, you get ripped off. You get a terrible exchange rate. 
And then you go using the money that you've just been ripped off on to go buy a sheep or something, and then you're ripped off again. You're ripped off twice, and Jesus is annoyed, and I, it makes me annoyed thinking about it too. So that's the first problem, is it's, it's, not, being, it's not there as a service to people. It's a racket. Um, it would be like having your little Christian bookstore and instead of the Bible being 20 or $30 like you it often is, you're charging two or three or $400 for a Bible and um, you know, telling people you're only allowed to buy it here, you're not allowed to buy it from somewhere else. You know, it's like it's set up in a certain way. They've traveled all this way. They can't get a sheep anywhere else. They can only get one here and the price is five times as much. It's, it's a scheme. <laughs> and um, Jesus was wild about it. I mean, he came in the night before, he looked at it, he, he went, it's like he said, what am I going to do about this? And he came back the next day and he said, this is a den of robbers. You're ripping people off and it's not fair. But he said something else as well. He says, my house is to be a house of prayer for all nations. What are the nations? They are the Gentiles. Now, you could say, I'm sure somebody would say this, they would say, oh, no, it's only just for the Jewish people coming from all the different places. Oh, no, <laughs> because that comes from the prophet Isaiah, and that is written before Jews lived all over the place. That was written in the Bible at a time when Jews only lived in one place. And the Lord said at that time that the temple was to be a house of prayer for the Gentiles. You know, uh, I think it was 2020. I, I remember there was a video called um, on YouTube and it was, you can, you can go Google it and find it. The greatest 10 discoveries of biblical archaeology for 2020. I think it was the 2020 year. And, um, you know, biblical, biblical archaeology is a big thing. They're finding all sorts of, uh, you know, all sorts of evidence, like corroborating information for the Bible all the time. And um, in 2020, they found a piece of, that came from the wall outside the temple, this piece of stone, and written in Greek, which is the language of people from all around the Roman world. All around the Roman world, everyone spoke Greek, but written in Greek is this piece that says, that um, Gentiles were not welcome to enter into the temple on penalty of death. So there was an actual wall with a sign on it that says Gentiles were not allowed to enter into the temple. But Jesus is saying, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer for the nations. And there's two ways of understanding it. Either it's a house of prayer where the people in the house pray for all the nations, or it's a house of prayer where all the people of the nations are allowed to come but it's actually both. It actually means both those things. So Jesus is wild because they've turned this house of his into a marketplace. They're ripping people off, but they also are not letting in people that are supposed to be allowed to come. They've excluded them. In the book of Ephesians, uh, Paul talks about this dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles. You know, the, the Jews were so focused on we are the chosen people and Gentiles are not allowed. And Paul called it the dividing wall of hostility. But he says in Christ, in Jesus Christ, that wall has come down. And it's true because in the gospel, we're all welcomed into the kingdom of God. But Jesus also knew that there was an actual wall with a sign on it, an actual wall that said Gentiles are not allowed in. And Jesus he knew that that wall had to come down too. So it wasn't just a wall in the spirit or a wall in culture that had to come down to, to include Gentiles. There was also an actual wall that had to come down. And in AD 70, when Rome destroyed Jerusalem, that actual wall did come down too. So Jews were probably expecting a Messiah that would act very differently to Jesus. They welcome him into the city as Messiah. But then he starts doing very unmessiah like things. <laughs> That's the reason why just a few days later they're saying crucify him, crucify him, because they think, no, we thought he was the Messiah, but he isn't. He's not doing what the Messiah came to do, but actually he was doing exactly what the Messiah was coming to do, but they didn't understand.
So Father, open our eyes that we might see Jesus as you truly are. Help us to understand our Lord and our Saviour, our Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.